uh, very good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good session yesterday for those of you who were involved in the um, focus groups. Uh, we uh, are at the conclusion session today um, and we've actually uh, consolidated with the help of all the moderators who moderated yesterday's session to really bring together some key points that were raised um, that we would like to share with all the participants of uh, the conference. Um, but more importantly, to also raise some key takeaways as well as uh, follow up actions, action points, so to speak. Um, and we hope that what we're going to be presenting to you would give you some reflection points, uh, even if you didn't participate uh, in yesterday's sessions, but that you would enable you to think through uh, what you might be doing in your institution and what you could be um, following up with, right? So we hope that would be helpful to you. Um, so representing um, all of the uh, moderators uh, is Joshua. <laughs> uh, he has very kindly volunteered his, his um, time with us. Um, and for those of you who don't, don't know Joshua, um, he is uh, a digital preservation analyst with Archives New Zealand. And uh, he's been involved or is involved in a mass, mass dis, di, di, digitization project uh, of all the magnetic material in New Zealand. So it's, that's a huge, um, at least a couple of years project, I think, on, on hand. And uh, Joshua has been actually involved with uh, Sipava for the last you know, couple of years uh, quite a quite a few long years already um, and we're, we're really glad to see him and, and have a familiar face here as well uh, in New Zealand so um, I'll let Joshua do some of that summary for you um, and for you to take in as to what were some of the key points that came out in the um, uh, focus groups yep Joshua Kia ora, uh, good afternoon for me and everyone else. Good morning, good evening. Um, so yes, I was asked to summarize the um, focus groups uh, that has happened yesterday. There were three um, different streams. One is the heritage institution, one is a film collection, and one is for uh, broadcast, I believe. Yep. And um, the moderators were given given uh, guidelines on on uh, what we can do, but um, uh, the questions that we had asked and things like that. But interestingly, we we um, took a while, but uh, most of our groups sort of um, started chatting and um, having a really um, wonderful conversation, some of us. Um, and I spent some time looking at the notes from each moderators together um, and, and I derived some common themes. Um, I might not be able to cover most of the points that have been raised, but I, I hope that um, we have the gist of it. So first and foremost, um, obviously, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, many places are still um, uh, facing the new waves that is coming. Um, and it has changed our operations quite significantly. Um, we have to work around and do many things to just to uh, continue our work. Um, but what is true from the points raised by participants is that um, even if, even when the pandemic waves keeps disrupting our plans, or like we have to quickly, creatively come up with different ways to do things, we managed to figure it out. And I think that is resilience, and that is that is um, that is really a proof that we we as Sipava um, as this community were able to still get continue our work. Um, not 100%, but we're still able to do the work that we do. Um, but the pandemic has also brought forward, and this is the interesting part, has brought forward digital transformation. It will almost be unimaginable to have everyone entirely virtual and online having this kind of conference just before the pandemic, and, and, and the technology might not be there. People were not so familiar with how things are, and so everything has sort of moved on to digital and it affect um, our outreach. It, affect, it affected our outreach in ways that we couldn't anticipate. 
uh, there were a lot of trial and errors. And some organization um, pivot their programming, their screenings online and got great reception. But at the same time, they also had a lot of increases of workload. Um, and how do we manage that? And that is that is one of the big challenge. Um, and even when we are trying to put things online, we also face with copyright reasons like that we can't put things online. Um, and there are many ways where we can try to you know, uh, get to a middle ground where we can work with filmmakers or content uh, copyright holders to say, maybe we'll introduce some kind of paywall uh, that you then you will let us put up online with different success and um, different degree of success. So these are some of the ways that we had to pivot. And we found new ways to outreach and connect with uh, communities, with with um, the people who who deserve uh, to, to access the collection that we hold. And it is also a recognition of the importance of using digital, the digital realm to create access for our, our collection. Um, and, you know, we talk about digitization and bringing things digital even before the pandemic, but the pandemic really, really highlighted that um, uh, it is a very strong area that we have to focus on to bring access um, to our collection. And obviously there's a lot also new social media platforms and new ways of accessing things and communicate with each other. And and we find that younger demographics, younger, younger people actually sort of got uh, very, uh, got into these technologies and these social media platforms very quickly. Things like TikTok, um, Clubhouse, Discord, and and there's new ways of communication. New communities are formed, and th there's something there that maybe we can tap onto. Um, and this brings to um, a, a related kind of a thread where, um, with the pandemic some of our operations are affected. For example, how, how are we um, able to do digitization because some of the decks we can't really bring home? <laughs> um, um, what do we do? Um, and, and, but at the same time, it also uh, increases the urgency of us needing to digitize some of this magnetic media, the tapes uh, that we all know that is a very at risk. There are various different uh, campaigns like Dateline 2025, like the UNESCO um, Magnetic Tape Alert, who, who basically say that, yeah, we need to digitize it now. But now with the pandemic, I, I think it is it is sort of the case is made. Like, this is the time. But where do we digitize? Uh, how do we digitize? Where do we get the tape decks? How do we select what to digitize? These are not new questions, but it came out during uh, the focus group because the urgency has is is now highlighted. And could it be that uh, we, 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 we share our digitization capabilities? Is that something that we can do uh, as, as part of a CPOWER community? That is one of the questions that was raised. Um, perhaps a resource lease of like, you know, uh, digitization expertise, vendors, uh, or, or you know, context and information about technicians who can repair tape decks. Maybe that's something that we can work together. Um, or even like publicized known resource, like um, there's this resource called the Minimum Viable Digitization Station. Uh, it, it's, it's a community resource created by um, uh, our colleagues uh, outside of uh, our region, but it, it details some of the basic fundamental elements of how you can build your own digitization um, station. Maybe we can publicize this resource. Or maybe CPOWER members, we should come together and share our workflows. You know, just share what we have done, what are the workarounds in which we have to do with like, you know, um, special machines that only operates in a certain way in our region. Uh, and that I think that will be valuable as well. So this came out in our focus groups. And this led on to the, the another, another area where the pandemic has affected, which is uh, repository management. Um, and this came about because um, the pandemic introduced introduce, uh, restrictions and restrictions means we couldn't really go in to even do uh, repository management work. 
uh, people can't go into the vault. People can go in, and we have to rely on you know uh, maybe a staff member who happened to stay nearby who can still do the work. Um, but at the same time, um, the 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 urgency to to manage the repository has also increased because right when we are in the pandemic, we are also in a very clear um, climate change environment. Uh, temperature has hit the highest in uh, in in many places, uh, floods and and just weird weather patterns and like you know um, we have flood in Australia, we have all kinds of things, and and it it is even more urgent that we need to figure out how to do this um, repository management, uh, and and the common questions like uh, what do you do uh, to tackle vinegar syndrome. Uh, what do you use? Do you use molecular sieve? Uh, do you put in deep freeze? Do you put in cold vault? What is the temperature and humidity? What is the common practice in the region? Has that changed during the pandemic? Um, is it even possible to maintain the ideal temperature for film preservation in our region? Um, questions that we have asked before and as has brought up before, but I, I believe that there is a need for an update for, for these best practices. Um, and yeah, so some of these are what has came out from the focus groups. Um, and this lead on, again, uh, nicely to the next point where we are talking about sustainability. So sustainability um, is, is very, it's a, it's a very interesting term because in the past, before, before we talk about sustainability in the, in, in the context of protecting the environment and making sure that we delay or mitigate climate change as much as we can, sustainability in our field um, used to mean succession planning. You know, how do we transfer knowledge of our collection, um, knowledge of the technologies, knowledge of operating obsolete equipment, um, and all of these things uh, are, are, are points that was raised. And it is an HO issue with with <laughs> with uh, with our field of work where it is important to have succession planning. But more importantly, I think um, what ca what came out as uh, a point is that we need to get senior management and key funders to understand the value of this knowledge. It's not only enough for us to plan for succession in our own team or our own department, but we also need to get people who are higher up to understand that. You know, it is not. We are not as replaceable as as some might think. Like a lot of organizational knowledge and lifelong uh, skills that it is just not so um, easy to you know pluck someone out and put someone back in again from another place. And 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 and, and that is like advocacy that we have to do. So that is sustainability in the succession planning sense. Um, back to the sustainability as part of to protect the environment. There are also um, groups who brought up um, questions like how to responsibly dispose of materials. Um, say we want to throw away the magnetic tapes. Um, is putting it in the landfill the best option? Uh, are there, I don't know, ways to take out parts and recycle them? Um, and I think that is a very greenfield uh, question. Um, Fortunately, <laughs> last year, uh, our keynote speaker, Linda Tatek, uh, actually uh, talked a little bit about this. And I was told that the presentation is now available on Sipava YouTube. So that is, that is something that we can look at. Maybe we can look at it again and highlight it, uh, work together to figure out how and what is the best practice for sustainability in the environment sense. And so, Next up, we go another common theme that we 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 figured is um, staff retention and recruitment. So I I would like to start this uh, this section with um, with a heartening story <laughs> from my group, who who has uh, who joined the archive with without any qualification and and the person had to learn the skills on the job, but at the end of like a long period of time. The person managed to train two new staff and is confident that the new staff can perform the task as good as um, the trainer. Um, so <laughs> you don't really hear this a lot, but um, the question is, how can we replicate this? 
um, what can Sipawa do to help to 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 ensure that this kind of like knowledge passing is happening? That is a point that was raised. Um, and obviously the, the the one way to tackle this issue is training. Um, I'm happy to be wrong, but I, I, from what I know and from what our group has sort of come to a consensus is that there's really only one higher learning institution that provides archival program in the whole of Southeast Asia and none with AV focus. And that is, that is interesting because all of us here uh, obviously uh, uh, have some part to play with AV collections or AV archivists ourselves. And, and why is it that there is no higher learning institution that provides any kind of program like this? Um, and and some of the suggestions that was that came out of from this question is that could it be uh, could we do some kind of um, micro le micro learning courses, maybe some certification, uh, maybe collate learning resources from what is available online into a central place? Maybe that's what we can do. Or, um, or maybe we can participate more in in our sister organizations like Amir uh, or FIAF or EASA, and they have training uh, online, and some of them are um, freely accessible. Um, maybe that is one way to do it. But as we talk about that, <laughs> um, it was also brought up that you know the time zone difference uh, is actually a problem uh, where. Even though those training are freely available, it is quite difficult to participate because they are in, often in the time zone that is, you know, in the middle of the night, two a.m. in the morning, um, and sometimes um, these courses are also uh, have a cost, and the cost is an issue because of the exchange rate. So some of this issue has been brought up. Uh, more importantly, online training can be really a bit daunting, you know. Um, uh, a lot of these courses assume some kind of basic understanding because outside of our region, there are courses where you can do, or you know, can get a basic degree or even a master's degree. So you, people are, have some kind of basic understanding going to this kind of uh, online webinars. But in our region, we are it, <laughs> we come from a completely different space. Uh, sometimes with no prior knowledge, and maybe the the um, the what we need is uh, some kind of one-on-one -on -one introduction or fundamentals training um, that uh, to fill the gap, so to speak. Um, and this ties in uh, uh, nicely to to some of the requests that we 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 gather from the different focus group, where it says that especially digitization and digital preservation um, are some of the areas where they need training opportunities. Um, and maybe Sipawa can help with matchmaking. Um, and that is an idea because the matchmaking uh, idea was create, was was brought up as maybe Sipawa can link up people with needs, with people who can provide the need, uh, provide the training or, or advice or things like that. Maybe that's one way to do it. And Final point about staff retention is that, um, and this is an interesting, interesting point because we all know that um, working in this field, there's not a lot of funding, and we have to be creative to retain our staff or even to recruit our staff. So what what is the key thing here is that we need to instill a sense of purpose uh, for uh, for the retain retention of staff, something that is beyond monetary comp compensation. Uh, it has to be something that is more than just a job um, so the question is well, what can the staff gain being part of a team that they wouldn't be able to get elsewhere or doing a different job um, and how is it how can we uh, as a team um, help each other to find the fulfillment and satisfaction ourselves beyond the the um, you know the monetary compensation and that is a very deep topic. I don't know, maybe we can have a session to talk about it, just come together and brainstorm. And it fundamentally is about finding the right people and and people who are trying to come into the field need to know what they are getting into as well. Because a lot of us are here for the long term um, and and what makes us tick? How, how do we derive that 
and 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 talk about this and and spread this and recruit people and include people into the team. Right, and um, so that is the general overview. And now we dive deeper into um, a particular area from from my focus group, which is film preservation, because we are the film collections focus group. Um, and in, when it comes to film preservation, we all know that film as a preservation format um, have lasted a long time. You know? It's like 100 years and, and going. And we know that it is a very uh, stable format that you know, and, and things can last a long time as long as you keep it uh, in the right condition. And we also know that digital technology is fleeting. You know, technology refresh happens. It used to be 10 years, then five years, and now three years, or even faster. And, and you know, like LTO tapes uh, are constantly refreshing and getting new ones and not truly backward compatible, for example. And it's also very expensive to maintain in the long run. But the fundamental fact is that, you know, just like we have mentioned, like digital is a thing that we have to do. Pandemic has caused us to uh, highlight the importance of doing digital. We still have to do it. So um, digital is, is expensive and we still have to do it. But at the same time, we also know that film is a format that can last longer. But why is it that, um, that all the film labs have closed and there is no means for us to develop film ourselves and 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 create more uh, films in the format that we know that is a long-term preservation. Um, there's a FIAF list of uh, film labs and it turns out there's only a handful left in the region uh, in, in Southeast Asia and Pacific. Uh, why is that the case? Um, is there something we can do about it? There's also a projectionist uh, skills shortage, you know, there's no more cinema that uses film. People don't really know how to project film anymore. And so the question is, how do we preserve operating knowledge? How do we preserve um, um, all of this equipment? And would we be left with film digitization as the only means to preserve film? As a community, is that what we want? Uh, is there something we can do now? There's a suggestion that came out which says that maybe we can do some oral history project to document the skills of technicians, engineers, uh, people who are operating all of this legacy equipment. Maybe that's what we can do. Um, but uh, is that something that um, we can do together? That's the question. And so that that's, that is the general sentiment from our, t our from our focus group. And the next next part of this is um, risk and disaster management, which is one of the topics that we are, we, uh, we talk about in the focus group. Um, the key point, the highlight for risk and disaster management uh, is that um, all of us are not prepared uh, when the pandemic hit us. <laughs> we plan for uh, natural disasters. We plan for an earthquake, floods, and fire. But we didn't plan for when the pandemic hit and uh, restrictions are in place, how do we uh, protect our collection? How do we protect the archive physically? And how do we protect the staff who's doing the work? And, and that is obviously a gap. And what has happened in the past two years is that we have sort of came up with our own uh, practice on how to mitigate this gap. Uh, maybe there is a chance for us to share what we have done in this space. Um, Maybe we can draw reference from other businesses who who um, who have a more detailed planning for situations like this, and they usually call it the business continuity planning (BCP). Or we can draw reference from um, at the IT field where they have like you know elaborate um, orchestration of disaster recovery plans. Uh, how how can this all play uh, play together and and help us to um, be more prepared if the next pandemic or next new thing that hit us. Um, so at the end, um, all of this <laughs> uh, goes back to this whole point that um, uh, we need to be we need to advocate. Um, the advocacy uh, is a I would say uh, part and parcel of 
of what we what we do as uh, what we are or what we need to do as archivists. We need to advocate, and we cannot uh, wait <laughs> uh, for um, for things to happen to us. And we need to use our collections strategically to advocate for um, funding, for support. Um, and I particularly would like to draw us back to our keynote, uh, which is Tim's uh, story that um, it is because of the film that was digitized and that he can he was able to see it and he was able to share it with his father. And the father was able to tell him the story about this ship that had such a big part in his family history. And, and, and this connection wouldn't have happened without the collection without uh, us archivists uh, doing um, making this accessible, digitizing it, and so the key part of this is that we should emphasize on the story. How can we turn our collection and extract the story, the human element, the connection with people out of this, and use that to advocate for our cause, advocate for preservation, advocate for more support, advocate for more funding. Um, it, it is clear that this, this way of advocacy is more, um, uh, more engagement and greater connection than um, us sharing technical processes, uh, which some of us might be really geeky and nerdy into this, but it might be too esoteric, too, too out of the norm for the lay people to understand. So the emphasis on the story is, is the key here. Um, so that is, that is my summary. Uh, I, I, I hope I covered most of the things. Um, and just because I'm talking, I would like to also uh, take the opportunity to ask a question because uh, I think the next part of this is that Sipava, which is Karen, would respond to, to this summary. Um, and, and while she does that, I would like to also throw in a question is that since we talk about advocacy, since we talk about reaching out, and since we talk about connection, um, if Sipawa were to start a Discord channel, um, Discord is a, a platform where uh, a lot of gamers and young people are hanging out, hanging out right now. Um, if we were to start a Discord channel, maybe Sipawa or maybe the members themselves start a Discord channel, would you join? Uh, is it time for another communication survey? Because uh, back in 2018, 2019, uh, I was tasked by Sipawa to do a communication survey, and some of you might have responded to the survey. And at that point, the um, <laughs> the majority of our members said that the best way to keep in communication is uh, direct email. So we created the uh, Sipawa group, the group.io, where we have a e mailing list going on. But that was pre-pandemic. Um, has things changed? If we were to try something different now or, or, or create a new platform, would you join? I think that is the question. Um, and that is all from me. <laughs> um, I would like to pass the time to Karen for her to respond to the summary. Okay, hi, back to me again. Thank you, Joshua, for um, you know bringing forth all of the some of the key points. Um, I hope that they would give you lots of reflective um, areas. Um, and certainly, there are perennial topics that have come up, but maybe with a sort of a different perspective, given the uh, sort of situation that we are in right now. Okay, um, so I was asked, what are we going to do now that we've given you all these suggestions and ideas and um, uh, what can Sipava do and what should Sipava be sort of stepping up in terms of uh, us as an association and helping our members or non-members for that matter um, who are interested or are working within this field in our region. Um, so what I'd like to do is to actually um, consolidate some of the ideas that came about. And um, I am not making 
and I, I'm not throwing our entire um, executive council uh, uh, under the bus because there's a lot of work to do, but um, it gives us some ideas to think about and suggestions to really consider. Um, given that our members and participants have raised these issues. Um, and um, I think the one of the core um, areas that seem to have come up is uh, obviously this idea of resource, right? As a resource um, platform, what can we offer and what more can we do? Um, and there were a number of more um, very specific um, ideas, which I think we could take on board uh, to, to consider. Uh, one is a guideline of sorts for um, deselection and deaccessioning, especially of original materials that you have digitized. So how do you, for example, determine the end of life for materials? Um, you know, when is it time to say that, you know, the material has to be, has to go? Um, so maybe some um, guidelines might be useful for our members, and we could think about uh, presenting that as a um, as a resource uh, package for people to to look through. Obviously, all of these would be as the word suggests guidelines, but they are good for you to have an overview and hopefully be able to utilize them within your context and the context of your institution, right? Um, the other component that came out was all these um, asking us to consider sharing or, or perhaps making it more evident on where training resources might be available. Now, some of us who follow um, the various international um, uh, institutions and, you know, or even online sort of resources, those of us who actually comb um, the internet for more of these things could actually uh, put together that list uh, for others who may not be as in Um And I thought that is actually something that's not too difficult to do. We could actually try to uh, start compiling a list of such uh, resources. And obviously, these are going to range from the very basic to something so much more um, difficult and beyond the range of our understanding. But that's also up to you to decide how and what might be useful, right? Uh, we've also been asked to um, help members and non member, you know, everybody um, sort of list out funding sources, um, things that come out as grants or scholarships or even um, stipends, um, you know, special kinds of uh, funding sources that. Uh, maybe are made available internationally uh, that people could apply for. And not everybody is in the know. Uh, not everybody gets updates on such things. So maybe Sipava could be that source to look out for such a compilation as well. Um, and the third one is actually training opportunities that are more uh, structured like organizational attachments or internships or um, perhaps even, um, I suppose, uh, the possibilities of uh, a cross-organizational exchange of sorts. I, I know this has been around a while, um, and so, some of you amongst our members may even have done so already. And I believe um, uh, uh, the Thai Film Archive, for instance, is also working with FIEF on uh, even bringing, you know, some... Uh, members from different archives to the to the archive the the, the Thai film archive itself I, I believe that's uh, something that you know can happen across our membership right and it is um, an exploration for us to to perhaps facilitate something of this nature okay um and that then brings us to sipava perhaps coordinating with other international um associations, uh, the, the larger ones um, like FIEF, IASA, AMIR, FIT, IFTA, etc., etc., um, or even ICA, you know, the Library Association. Uh, all of these uh, associations create training for their members, but this is something that we could tap on given their um, much larger 
uh, size and expertise um, that we could also try and see if they could make this training available in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and and we'll, we'll see how that actually pans out. And I think a lot of our sister organizations are quite happy to assist. Um, it's just trying to find the right time and the right sort of space. Uh, it does require quite a bit of coordination. Um, so I, I do ask for your um, patience in, in us trying to work these things out because understandably, this is across multiple uh, institutions and we do have to work within certain limitations, right? Um, but it's still a great suggestion and I, I would be quite keen to um, explore and take this on uh, with um, these other associations. Um, Another thing that was raised was how we can um, update some of our existing resources. I know that um, to the um, uh, thanks to the generosity actually of Ray and Mixed Time, they've, they've actually put together previously a checklist um, of sorts for AV archives. Um, and we're thinking maybe we should uh, update this and expand it into something that is almost like a toolkit. Um, I believe one of our uh, participants from the Pacific raised uh, the idea that Parbika, one of the uh, Pacific associations, actually drew up a, um, a, a toolkit of, of such, and they've been using that as a reference. Um, I thought that it's actually something that we could update um, our existing um, checklist into something more comprehensive, maybe just to expand it um, and to update it to our current times. Um, and it could be uh, useful, I suppose, for uh, all of our um, mem attendees to have a look at something of this nature. Right? Um, Joshua mentioned just now that about this idea of a matchmaking kind of thing. And I thought of thinking of it almost like an infrastructure of sorts. Um, could be a pretty ambitious project, obviously, um, but I, I thought I'd still put it out there um, because if we were to link available services, equipment, expertise, um, things that are available, maybe perhaps starting within Supava and then you know expanding it over time to the people who might need them. So we, we kind of do a match. It could be something, um, that might be made available and then people could apply for it or, or list their um, interests. And then, you know, we could try to see what actually matches. And obviously the key word here is to match, right? It may not happen, but it there is actually information there that such um, services or um, uh, expertise might be available. So even if we can't match it at that point, you could actually take the conversation offline to approach these people separately, um, you know, something of that nature. And I thought it's maybe worth thinking about. Okay. Um, and of course, the last point that came out a lot was how Sipava can facilitate communication between organizations within the region and internationally. Um, and I really believe in this. I, I think that was that has always been the point of a network of this nature. Um, but over the years that I've also been with Sipava, and this is, and, and, and um, I, not to put it on anyone, but this is something that I re recognize myself as well. We do need to communicate um, our needs. Nobody would know that we need that help if we don't say it, or if we don't bring it up to somebody to say, you know, I have this problem, do you know anyone who might be able to help? And you'll be surprised at the number of people who are more than happy to come on board and say, you know, I met this person, I could actually link you up. And it's it's just amazing this um, um, kind of networking that can happen, but only if people know that you actually need that help, right? So I'm appealing in some ways also to the fact that to make the Pava's work um, work for you, we've got to be a lot more communicative. We've got to be able to talk to each other. And there must be some way for us to perhaps um, uh, link up better, right? 
And of course, this then brings me um, to um, Joshua's point about that Discord channel. Um, it may not be a Discord channel, it may be something else, but the, the idea is that perhaps we should have more casual, regular meetings amongst members or non-members, anybody who would like to join in. It could be something that ha doesn't have any fixed agenda. Um, people come in to discuss some issues um, or to meet with people, right? And then it really does allow us to have this discussion on a, a more generic level, but um, the ability to also delve into certain uh, deeper or more complex issues. Um, because of the regularity, it may give us that opportunity to find out what's happening. Um, and I believe some of these um, kinds of meetings are happening across uh, different associations. I know Amir has one because I've um, tried to participate in it, although the timing was crazy. Um, but, you know, it, it, it does give us a chance to talk to people in our field, right? So I, I what I'm trying to say at this point is that I will bring all of these things that I've uh, shared here that can consolidate it in what I've heard from people um, to the table with our council members. Um, you know, and, and what we're going to do at least from, and I'm putting on the hat of not just um, president of CIPAVA, but also as a member institution, right? Um, what's the best way to approach this? And I think we will try to do what is most doable in the short term. And then we'll look at what can be achieved in the mid midterm, um, but we will need help. And the, we have only these number of um, uh, members in the council. We are all volunteers. We do need your assistance. And I really appeal that when we do put out a call, uh, that people will come forth uh, to help because that's the only way we can make this all happen. Uh, we do rely on your expertise as well. Um, some of you will bring fantastic ideas to us. Um, and, you know, many hands do sometimes make the work lighter. Um, uh, obviously, we do want to make this effective and efficient. So we'll try to ensure that, you know, things are kept um, quite uh, neat, uh, but at the same time, I really appeal for um, your support when the time comes, uh, you know, when we're asking for assistance in some ways, right? Um, and um, I am actually looking in some forward to um, the, actually this idea of uh, meeting regularly. Um, and we, we joke about this quite a bit uh, yesterday, you know, that if we actually have a, a Sipava Discord um, we're actually quite um, up there in, you know, in in this hip <laughs> uh, uh, sort of environment, um, and um, and I think our members, um, just given by your enthusiasm on uh, this gather platform, gather town platform, that you'll figure it out, that you will join in, and I'm very confident that um, uh, all of you will will actually. Um, you know, kind of come to enjoy this um, quite a bit. Um, so that's where I stand on um, coming in from Sipava's, you know, sort of uh, standpoint. Um, and I wanted to end this session uh, really just to ask you to, um, again, reflect on some of the key points that we've uh, raised. Um, we won't uh, have a direct Q&A here, um, but because after the session, we have two hours of, you know, gathering uh, time for us to chat among ourselves, but also to, uh, for any one of you who would like to give us some feedback or to tell us some of the ideas that you didn't have um, an opportunity to um, in, in the first two days, for instance. Um, so we'll be around, you know, all of us here for the next two hours. Um, and um, of course, Sunshine has reminded that there is a surprise after this. So please don't disappear. We want to um, have that sort of um, gathering and definitely to take a photo for the memory lane, for the memory and the album. Um, and I've also been asked uh, to uh, remind everyone here 
number one, uh, that you will uh, get an evaluation form <laughs> after, <laughs> as part and parcel of um, trying to find out how we can improve, wh what were the good things that you enjoyed about. And of course, this is also to enable us to um, uh, consolidate all of this to our sponsors um, um, and to UNESCO um, and to give them some feedback as well. Um, and of course, there is the archival gem screening. Um, members have actually given, you know, uh, clips of their gems. Um, it's going to be taking place on Sapawa's Facebook page. Um, they're going to be uploaded uh, in, you know, so gradually. So there will be new things to see every couple of days. So please, you know, sign in, log in, um, follow um, and watch some of these gems. And um, also... Do look out for announcements um, on uh, conf the com our conference in 2023. Um, we will make those announcements where we do have some uh, very firm, uh, concrete uh, details for you. Um, the last announcement is actually about the Sipava book. And I, it's just like fresh off the um, news. Um, uh, Nick De Campo, uh, our, the, our editor of the the book Keeping Memories, Cinema and Archiving in the South uh, in the Asia Pacific, um, has just informed that the book has been printed. So we're really happy. Um, it will be officially um, available uh, soon. Um, I think. Um, um, uh, it, the Ateneo publishers um, in, in Manila will be uh, sending out, uh, you know, that in, that announcement uh, in due time. So look out for that as well, and uh, we'll be really appreciative of the support. All right? Okay. So I guess um, I've come to the end of this session, um, and again, I would like to thank everyone for your attendance um all to all our thank you to all our speakers our moderators um all the folks behind the scenes who have who have been making this um you know happen um our translator uh olivier um was working hard to put all this you know available for for our participants as well um Thank you so much uh, for making Sipava's, um, you know, annual conference, you know, such a such a joy to be with at. Um, and I hope that you'll stay on, uh, you know, for more. Right. So thank you again, and um, don't run away. Just stay till sunshine comes on. <laughs> All right. Then. Thank you.